grand finals of BTS America's 2. $10,000 of prize money up for grabs. And we got to find out which team will walk away with $5,000 and which team will get a $3,000 prize. This is Kyle Guy for Beyond the Summit. I'm going to be joined once again from my good buddy Blaze. Blaze, we've gone on a nice little adventure here at the back end of BTS Americas. And I'm excited to have you back for what should be one of the hypest matchups ever. Cloud9 against Team Imagine. Take it all in, buddy. <laughs> what, what do you think coming into this? Absolutely. I'm just really excited to see these two teams in action. I really want to see what Team Imagine bring to it in particular, because I think Cloud9 are going to just continue to play their style, uh, effective as always, and they definitely look to be one of the top three teams in North Mank right now. But Imagine are still vying for that spot, and uh, I was excited about a lot of teams going up against Cloud9. Uh, Team Fire, obviously, went up against them in the previous round. High Council had a shot of making it to the Grand Finals, but no, it's Team Imagine versus Cloud9, and this is just going to be absolutely intense. Seeing these two teams in action, and uh, really what they bring to the table here. Uh, I've talked about it before. Cloud9 seem to be the best research team. They have a they have coach and they have 1437 mm -hmm. as captain, and both of them are really involved in planning out uh, their plan of attack. So we're going to see initial bands of Bleshrek, since they're second pick, and the Storm Spirit, since they're going up against Francis, aka Chilonqua, aka Mineski Fanboy. This is a pretty smart opener, but imagine, I'm, I'm curious what they do with Before we get to the moment here where we're going to see how the team is going to dive in with their first pick, brief history lesson here on how we got to this point. For anyone tuning in late, Lena is going to be the first grab, by the way, for Leviathan. We start at the top, Cloud9, they beat out the open qualifier, XD Gamers, 2-0 easy, moved on, Farouk Gaming, a 2-0 there, then in the semifinal, Technically a 2-0, though the first game was a default win due to fire scheduling. But that means Cloud9 have made an undefeated tear all the way through, similar to what they did in Nanyang. At the bottom of this bracket, you can see Team Imagine, or now Team Leviathan, as they did 2-0 against Sector V, moved on. And this is where they really started turning heads. They 2-1 to the Council of Wizards and Priests, the Mason stack. And then they blasted past Complexity 2-1 yesterday. And now here they are with their definitely toughest test so far in taking out Cloud9. Now, after the Lena pickup from the side of Leviathan, Cloud9 respond, and they get that pesky little bounty hunter, and again, we're going to see a lot of value blaze in getting an early Templar Assassin. Yeah, absolutely. Shibby knows this matchup decently because he has to play against Templar Assassin quite a bit. He also plays a heck of a lot of TA, but, I mean, we've seen Brax do some amazing things on this hero, and I expect to be seeing a lot of momentum Banging in their favor if they, they're roaming appropriately. The Bounty Hunter can help cover uh, the bottom rune for the Templar more often than not. Um, that extra mana supply from the bottle is going to allow her to just keep spamming that refraction and, generally speaking, trade very effectively against Shibby. Um, but we'll see. Uh, I mean, obviously, the Spirit Breaker roaming in uh, can punish because she doesn't have a stun. There can be a lot of great aggression there. And looking to see what Jenkins does on that hero. Jenkins, uh, he played an amazing Spirit Breaker the other day. He was very involved in every kill. They coordinated timing of their stuns and their attacks pretty much to perfection, and I'm looking for more of that. Uh, I was talking to Jenkins yesterday. He looks at this matchup here, Cloud9, as kind of the final boss. These guys are really large and in charge in the scene since they formed, and I think all the teams, uh, even EG, are looking at Cloud9 as far as a, a team to uh, take on. we got to remember as well, this is going to be a full best of five, and neither team has any sort of winner's advantage. Both came in equally from the same bracket, and I'm curious to see, with that many kind of games on the line, if either team looks to be a bit flexible with their draft how comfortable maybe leviathan want to be with maybe pulling out that jenkins pudge from time to time not suspecting it here obviously in game one with the commitment already to spirit breaker but even in the next game when they still have at least one game to kind of put out i'm curious to see if they're going to be trying to think outside the box for now things seem pretty cookie cutter and uh I, i'm frankly not surprised by that they kind of maybe want to get a good strong stepping stone you you lead off with a game one win and you're already motivated, confident, and your morale is going to be on a high, kind of moving through the whole series. Imagine if it's going to be Leviathan who come out with a Game 1 win. Team like Cloud9, who typically has been performing better than most, could be shaken up a bit. They did get 0 2 against DC. Uh, I believe it was at ESL 1 qualifier, if I'm not mistaken. So we don't know how they are about being able to bounce back. But to strategize, certainly one of the best out there. 
tens. Absolutely. Now, talking about this next phase, I've, I would say Imagine are already feeling pretty decent about this. The Spear Breaker is great, charging against the Bounty Hunter, keeping track of him uh, while he moves about the map. This will enable them to either dust or sentry appropriately to really stop the Bounty Hunter's momentum. Still, eventually this guy gets level 6. He's going to be giving good amounts of farm to their alternative cores and, of course, their other support. So, um, this will, for the most part, leave 1437 as kind of this solo support. He's going to be focusing on just zoning and harassing on the lane. We've seen him play Winter Wyvern in this capacity, but they're banning it out here. Um, there's Witch Doctor, there's sometimes Skywrath, if you really want the Arcane Bolt just poke back the opposition, but no matter what, he's going to be pretty independent. He's going to have to be if they're going to be able to deal with the Spirit Breaker directly. In the meantime, the Ember Spirit is a great safe laner in this context because not only can he deal with Lena's early damage output, thanks to the Flame Guard, but he's also able to break Spirit Breaker's charge in multiple ways. The Sleight of Fist dodge, or even the Searing Chains to break it, and we've seen that uh, performed pretty well by uh, SVG in the past, or Ritsu in the past. They were also focusing a bit onto uh, Ritsu on what he was playing They've already been at the AM and then the PL. I can't help but get a small sense that maybe Cloud9 are like, okay, we got to get something that works and that's still available. Otherwise, we risk losing that as an option altogether. Ember being that grab, something Lumdum boasted himself as what he feels is Ritsu's best hero. We didn't get to see much of it through the Nanyang rung, and it has popped up since then. But I think this is going to be the first time I'll be able to personally cast a game of a Ritsu Ember, and after hearing how confident Lumdon was with him on the hero, I'm, I'm very eager to see. But Imagine, or Leviathan, do have time to respond to it, whether it be some sort of fashion of uh, lockdown or silence. It looks like they'll at least lead in with a good old reliable uh, Earthshaker, something they tend to fall back on. And a nice thing going for them, though, is if this is going to be the core like Shibby Lena, typically a Yule's candidate, is very good at being able to eliminate a Flame Guard fast there. So it's they have a little bit going for them, but that team in response that you were talking about before, that selfless support, either it's going to be Dazzle or Wyvern or Witch Doctor, looks like it'll be the Dazzle on this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of strength there. Obviously, giving the Ember Spirit uh, some armor to work with is never a bad thing. He's one hero that lacks that agi gain, um, but this is going to be dangerous. Now, they know what they're going up against. The draft has been kind of ambiguous to this point. They ex assumed the mid lane Lena. They didn't know about the Spear Breaker because they ended up banning Pudge just in case. Mm -hmm. And then the Earthshaker was probably support. Now we see the Naga Siren and the lanes start coming into focus for Team Imagine. They are going to be running this safe lane Naga Siren for Francis. We're going to be seeing the mid Lena for Shibby. Uh, pretty much two signature heroes to a degree. Obviously the Storm Spear might be a little bit better uh, in their core position, but otherwise very signature. Adding in the potential for New Sham to initiate and counter-initiate in the Earthshaker, uh, Jenkins to move across the map, and Flying Zebra to prick pretty much pick up any support he wants. Uh, I'd, I'd say Witch Doctor is fine here, Rubik's pretty good. Um, yeah, there are a lot that can they can work with. But right now, just with these four alone, I think Team Imagine are pretty confident and comfortable going into game one. So are we sold that this is a one-position Naga right now? Can this not still plausibly be? I guess you're right, then, because we already have Jenkins still set on that anticipated Spirit Breaker. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's going to be a situation here with the Cloud9 pickup that could force him to somehow flip the script. Uh, but what could the response be from Cloud9 if it is going to be that one position Naga? The fortunate thing is mm -hmm. they have an Ember to deal huge cleave damage to help with the illusions a bit. But what about rounding it out? The, the three position here, the MSS grab, seems to be uh, what they need to look for. Um, they can be looking towards their uh, signature Slardar they've been running a lot of. They could be looking at the Undying. The Clockwork is still in the pool. All these heroes compare pretty well with the Bounty Hunter. Ooh, Clockwork, um, yeah. Clockwork seems mm, pretty nice yeah. against the Earthshaker. Especially against Naga, because if you yeah. get her inside the Cogs, there's nothing she can do. Yeah, I would really like to see that. And he could get. He has enough reach later on. She tries to escape with a Song TP. He can get there and get the uh, hook connection at least going in. Hmm... Wouldn't mind it at all. We know MSS can certainly perform. We've been seeing a lot of them with the Dark Seer, a lot of them with the Clockwork. But Leviathan had anticipated possibly a sneaky brood pick. Not something I'd seen MSS personally play a lot, but it could force them into a bit of a predicament in the early laning phase that they don't want to be in. And there it is. It will be the machine. Clockwork going to get snagged up for Cloud9. Now we look to Leviathan here. Anticipating possibly the, a secondary support, certainly if they <clears> want to <throat> put Francis on the Naga. Uh, I don't think Clockwork's going to force enough of a scare where they have to totally shift it up. What what hole is missing in this four-man group right now that can assist him a bit? 
Hmm. I mean, I don't think they have to get any hero at this point. Anything that's five position that can do well in terms of range support will work fine. I mentioned the Witch Doctor and Rubik as my top two. I think I'll stick with that. Um, but, I mean, anything that can zone, anything that can harass the clockwork directly and uh, get involved in the fights. I also pin down the Bounty Hunter. That's important. If you have any good disables, you'll be able to combine that with Dust to kill off the Bounty Hunter once or twice, and that'll really shift momentum in your favor as well. So, disable is the important thing, and I think I with the lion, which that, offers yeah. two of them. Yeah, I was thinking that as well because, like, well, if you need to get the the, the quick one, the slippery is an ember. A lion may not be too shabby here, and it's hmm. possibly going to be a lion with a bit of priority. And yeah, I see that as well. Jenkins hopping onto the Earthshaker, at least for now, poses that this will be more of a aggressive roaming spear breaker. I think they'll. Do you spot, think that kind of makes sense? It's still possible they actually do. That off lane, the spirit hell? breaker gets more involved. I think they'll swap. Uh, it's I guess if they, they wanted to really counter out the bounty hunter, if they wanted SVG to have a really slow progression, the spirit breaker lion, Nagasari, those three heroes could really punish him. So maybe this could be a support spirit breaker that gets some detection going and pretty much makes his job kill Gondar every time he turns a corner. So I could see there there being some value in that. Obviously, you get some more gank opportunities on the TA more directly, but I, I still think that there's a possibility that they'll spot this. I believe it was in Cloud9's matchup against Fire as well, and was kind of put in a position where he couldn't do typical annoying bounty hunter things, and it felt like he was being very, very passive to the point where I remember checking on being like, okay, he's still 0-0-0. Zero, zero, zero. But within the next like 10 minutes or so, quickly popped up to like 4-0, and zero. track was coming in. So SVG is that kind of a player who's happy to be disciplined to put, you know, to just wait out his timing window to be successful on this bounty, not risking doing anything too assertive that maybe Leviathan would suspect. For now, though, he just kind of moves in a bit deep, plants down that pesky little blocking ward, kind of a common spot. Leviathan, though, they're doing the Leviathan smoke movement right under the nose of t and he doesn't even realize what's happening in front of him. And he goes down. Oh, the cheeky Leviathan squad shows a little bit of the old strategies. Not doing that common check out the off laner, see if they're warding, and then huddle around the rune. They do something a bit different, and it certainly caught Steven off his guard. Yeah, very brute force. Just get in there, get um, some potential first blood. And yeah, the fact that um, 437 really wanted to scout out the ward actually cost him his life. They get a good ward down anyways. There's no way that Cloud9 are certain of. Uh, they could probably think of three different wards spots for Imagine right now, and I'd probably say the one that's placed on the field top lane is the least priority of all of them. So that will probably stick. And with that, they're going to get a Fisher block for the Air Shaker. They're going to get the Shibby Bounty Rune. I think overall Imagine are, are looking good for their opener. Oh, I certainly agree. And it's not even the worst thing ever. That Lion was able to get that first blood bounty that increases that early extra boost. That means earlier boots, maybe the extra couple of wards. It's free and easy money, and for supports, it certainly can matter a lot. And he looks like he'll be heading his business to the bottom lane with that first blood bonus, uh, bonus for now. So it's going to be a Naga Lion to zone back this clockwork a bit, who can usually handle his own in the 2v1. But look at this, SVG is handling. They trade. Oh, they eat each other's sentries, so they're instantly going to be denied. But there's no more sentries for Shibby right now. SVG still holds one, but he knows that he'll be hiding in the shadows from here on out until there's going to be a new sentry placed. Which there will be. Well, he'll, yeah, he'll get some basic coverage here, but another sentry could eat that in turn. Oh, the Lysar Gray reveals that, so now he can go in and, and tango it, most likely. But we'll keep an eye on that. In the meantime, uh, we have some stacking going on from Nushram. Knows he can't pull, since that has been warded off. So he goes ahead and just finds the next most valuable thing. They have two double stacks on the field for Shibby. Could be a nice little boost for him. Especially if this lane becomes a bit too sticky for him here. Now that this TA feels very comfortable with the watch of the Bounty Hunter, we already know TA is just kind of one of those CS queens, especially with denies. Could certainly put Lena in her place very fast, if not kind of contained a bit. But look at Jenkins. He's trying to work with a bit of a pull here. Uh, he's not going to take it all the way to the left. Knows that Steven is nearby and could contest it a bit. No, oh, look at that. A level up into early Shadow Poison here. Mm -hmm. Dazzle kind of says, you know, we might look to go a bit offensive in this lane. Yeah, that's actually pretty interesting that he's going to be going for that instead of the defensive skills. But even more interesting is the fact that I find that I only purchased one ward uh, for Cloud9 in the opener. They have one ward in their shop, now two actually have refreshed in the stock. And the only ward they actually placed out was the one that blocked out the pull camp 
I mentioned before. Was Other it, than that, they are playing very conservative. Was it them who did that yesterday as well? What team did that yesterday that we were kind of like, oh, there's only one ward out and they saved the other one? I can't remember if it was that game or if maybe it was complexity or Leviathan. Yeah, I think it was complexity and they still ended up using it, but they uh, buy it in the first like round oh, of yeah, items. That's correct. But yeah, Cloud9, they're like, yeah, we'll save 100, 100 gold here for maybe something else. Very, very interesting. And it saves up, and they can get two wards at the, you know, three-minute onward mark. Maybe they find more value in having the extra bit of vision at that point. We'll have to see. Mm -hmm. uh, here comes Bounty Hunter. They picked up a DD room recently. Now hides under, knows that there's a pull happening here, but no real opportunity. This is not an easy support group to gank here if you're a Bounty Hunter. Two different types of disable here. A Nushum, you got a Fissuring or Shaker nearby. SVG is not going to find any sort of easier, easily, uh, you know, weak and wounded support you know, limping around. Okay. So uh, the reason that it's about really valuable to get an extra 75 gold to start off is because actually Theban had to buy the Sentry Wards for Bounty Hunter. So Bounty Hunter got to open up with the Orb of Venom and uh, just gets to roam around and, and focus on his own buildup. Well, yeah, the Dazzle had to pretty much go full consumables. Sentries and courier and all this stuff. So one word is pretty much all he had in the budget under those circumstances. Yeah, it just seems like it's it's going to be allowing them to get a lot more map control when uh, Clockwork and Bounty Hunter want to start ganking. And it's also a really cost-effective way to manage your items in the early game. Brax is really starting to take off in this mid lane a bit. 19 and 10 to Lena's 13 and 3. No stacks built up yet in the Ancients for him though. We anticipate an early Desolator and a move into there. And then eventual segue into the Roche if the TA gets to follow her storyboard that we see from every game. And for Jenkins, who now has to deal with the pressure of three, SVG kind of comes up here now. This is where maybe that uh, Poison Touch could come in handy if they were playing on being a bit offensive. But it's not easy yeah. to catch a Spirit Breaker. He can charge out, though Shuriken would have an answer for it and possibly some chains if Ritsu can get a good connection. I think that's the most important thing, is the searing chance connecting the way they want them to. There was a Janata strike, but Jenkins will be able to charge back, bashing Ritsu, therefore the chains won't come. So that's uh, going to happen probably more often than not. It's Ritsu who has to have pretty much impeccable timing, casting the spell essentially simultaneous with Jenkins' charge. He actually makes the full committed charge all the way to mid lane and says, what's up? And we'll hang out here a bit eventually to make his return, but he does make it out safely, gets that little gracious bump under Ritsu before the chains can actually go out. And MSS is actually probably in some trouble here as a result. I mean, if they go for a Fisher block play, yeah, they're charging him, they have vision on him, there's the Fisher block, and they know there's no bounty hunter to help Ooh, him. There's still a crack to slip through. The LSA will connect. Shibby waits with a Dragon Slave, and it will connect there at the end. Actually, Nushim gets the last hit. Look at the follow-up charge now coming out, but the stun's going to miss from Nushim, and they will not proceed forward. Would have been hard to break through that refraction regardless, especially since Laguna is not quite up yet but they still get the one pick, and for that, Leviathan will pull ahead now 2-0. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that stun is really difficult for the line. I think the Spearbreaker has to level and uh, use Empowering Haste immediately to give uh, Nushem the boost there, but instead, they just pick up the Clockwork, which is great. The Bounty Hunter has been at least uh, inactive for the past minute, and then, yeah, they're still, they have the Flying Courier, so there's no risk there. Now they're looking at this stack. Shibby seems to be making his way there already, and then he can just bottle up the second rune, make up for the mana expended. During this as well, Jenkins made a brief stop off with the Courier and has picked up some dust here, so they are going to be on Bounty Watch soon. And speak of the devil, he was able to plant his own pretty aggressive Obs Ward here to check out that deeper stack and could, you know, maybe catch someone in passing. Right now, though, he's walking a little close to trouble. Even Nushim has some dust on hand, so he knows that there's just no one easy to try to creep on here. And if he takes one misstep, could get caught out with a quick dust, quick disable, and not see the next day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but blind dusts are almost never going to happen, so essentially it just means he cannot uh, reveal himself in any way. He can't uh, go visible for even a second under Observer Ward Vision. He has to make sure that he's always in like the trees when he casts that Shadow Walk. And he's still only level 2, so uh, it looks like he'll probably leech uh, from the jungle to try to get a little bit more uh, experience momentum. He's going to get right here. Brax is working his way through a nice big old stack right here, a juicy one, and that will put him up. Probably upgrade his shoes here and then start building towards probably that first hammer. He's got plenty of stacks here as well, even up and behind. Ritsu all the meanwhile, quietly, patiently farming here. Now I had in CS, so 35-24 for him. So he has the Wraith Ban as the Aquila comes to a complete. Bottom lane, the Naga though, completing her Aquila already. We'll have to see. 
if I remember correctly, how soon did he put off going for the Radiance? He didn't stop off for no. drums or anything like that. He just... Nothing at yeah. all. I mean, I don't even think he got tier two boots. I think this is the items he had when he started moving towards that Radiance. So uh, if he can get the same kind of momentum that he had in the last game, I expect him to pretty much follow suit and uh, not touch anything other than a TP scroll until he has a Sacred Relic. MSS, though, also gets his level six now. Hasn't invested the point yet into Hookshot. Looks like he'll wait it for now. Maybe he needs to make a quick and hasty decision whether he needs to put the extra point into Rocket in addition to it because I only see five <laughs> points spent right now. Looks like he'll wait a bit. Is it important for him to probably adventure away from this and look to set up a different lane or is he going to need help here and assistance on the bottom? Oh, we had to hold that thought though. Smoke move, which is going to be popped. There's going to be oh, the dust. See him. It's a bit late. They might be able to turn the corner and catch him. Shibby goes the other way. They can't quite... Oh, there he is. He's right there. Oh, they go in. Ellis, they will connect now. But he's going to be blind. Doesn't matter, though. Dragon Slave catches him right there at the end. And it looks like Leviathan will get another sweet little pick. And that's what I'm talking about. One little misstep. And you'll be spotted out. There'll be the dust. And now Leviathan will be ahead 3-0. Yeah, very nice momentum for them. The Spearbreaker is about to hit level 6. So he's going to be having as much tempo control potential as the Clockwork himself. And this is going to make it more difficult for Cloud9 to actually get kills. Ritsu's in farm mode, and Brax here has to have a lot of backup if he's going to fight. Um, the Bounty Hunter, I think, is really the liability of Cloud9 right now. SVG has accomplished almost nothing this game. Boots and Orb of Venom is all he has, and this is without him buying much more than maybe one or two Alps Wards. So, uh, very detrimental to the, the, their movement and their ability to come online. They need to make sure that Bounty gets tracked within the next few minutes. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Like, he was very good at being passive previously, but this time he has been caught out and punished for it. Look at the attention to bottom lane now as MSS would love to put the hook shot to use. He's going to get the jump here onto Naga, and she begins that battery assault dance. Oh, oh convenient. Fissure. Nice. Fissure will bump her out into safety and now always has the song in case things do get hairy. Beautifully done right now to recognize that if he gets the split between the two, she's going to get forced out. That was a beautiful manipulation mechanics. Just knowing the the hitboxes essentially that you there's you're, you're taking space away, and this is actually a, a carryover from Warcraft 3, where essentially when you have too many units in one spot, you, you, if a building or any other terrain comes into play to interfere, it just pushes units out to the closest spawn position, which happens to be outside the cog. So very smart usage from Flying Zebra there, and uh, unfortunately they're still under fire. This is a 3v2 movement. She does have the song still. We'll decide to go for the split first. Now goes the cogs and oh. waited a bit too long to get that song out. And that means the, f the battery salt will come. And Zebra, who already committed a fissure earlier to harass out MSS, can't save her in the same way. So because there's a bit of a lack to be like, hey, I don't have a fissure if they jump you, she doesn't dish out the song soon enough and will be caught out. So Shibi still going to be picking up a nice rune here. He's very close to the Yule Scepter. Going to be looking for kind of kill combos uh, from that point forward. You mentioned against the Ember Spirit, uh, that Flame Guard isn't going to mean too much unless he times it after the Yule's conclude, right before the Lightstrike Ray hits him. And that's, uh, it requires a lot of button spamming. But uh, yeah, still, I mean, we're going to see this rotation. They're putting a lot of emphasis on pinning down the Naga, but first, his bodyguard, the Earthshaker, gets hooked. Yep, and he's going to continue to do that that unfortunate dance of death where you're just like, oh, 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 trying to raise your log and can't do anything about it. But look at the retort coming out. Jenkins charging, uh, charging in, gets the hit on the MSS. Nether Strike and the chops coming out. Heal's not going to be enough from 1437, so they will take MSS down, and they are still on the prowl here. Jenkins with a charge in one, but look at this. Brax waits here. Rex waits. They'll scout each other out. The charge lead in from Jenkins. Refraction, though, still holding up all that damage. Now SVG shows himself. He does get the dust off the song, though. Will save Double Jenkins. Stun. Now comes Nushim. He's lining up the mini Ravage here. Looking to set up the two-man stun. He waits. He gets it. Get they it. try to split, but it's not going to be enough. They get the one grab, taking out SVG. Now they turn over, looking for Brax. Eats the finger. Here comes Ritsu. Beautiful remnant in. He's trying to go for a focal point onto Shibby here. Shibby's going to get sliced up, but gets to the Laguna, but it's on to the refraction. Brax will shrug that one off, and they get a good grab on the Lena. Now they're still moving on in. They want to get a hold of this Naga. They know she has no song. She barely has any mana. Has 14 wand charges, but it's going to be for nothing here. They have swarmed around here. It looks like Blaze. It's a four-on-one, and Naga has nowhere to go except become sweet little sliced sashimi. <laughs> she is out. It's going to be two taken down. How many all day, though? This fight recap certainly not going to help.
Yeah, the Earthshaker went fight. down along with that for Team Imagine, and then of course uh, the yeah there was the Bounty Hunter kill very early on in that as uh, the Dazzle getting caught out. We're gonna see a hook shot here on a Flying Zebra. Looks like he'll be going down once more, emphasizing the fact that mid game they need to find a four staff. We're gonna see this uh, charge with another strike here, although the Light Striker will not connect fully. It looks like they still have the kill with thanks to that dust. So uh, a big aspect of what happened in the jungle there really comes down to Shibby. Uh, the there was an illusion of the Templar. Assassin there that had her health and mana, and they essentially were 50 50 split on which one was the real TA. So they hit the dust stun, but Shibi keeps chasing down the illusion of the Templar Assassin and misses a free Laguna on a reflection reflectionless TA. And then obviously later on, she was in desperation, getting pinned down by two heroes, just had to drop the Laguna uh, all for naught. Because of it, Cloud9 get a lot back there, but I gotta say, they do have a good little punching bag target in SVG. They always seem to kind of catch him out and have his number, and it does continue to give Leviathan a little bit a little bit more. And this SVG continues to kind of get bullied down. He is still trying to even get to that level 6 and get that track gold online. I mean, Cloud9, if they had an exchange like that with the track gold on top of it, they could have been way up and ahead. Brax could have been even closer, if not finishing out possibly a Desolator. For now, has the one hammer, about to finish out the second one. And then Roche becomes much sooner as a possibility on their agenda. So we'll have to see. For now, the Leviathan gathering around back at this mid lane. SVG has been constantly going on these very deep ward expeditions. Might get a courier here. There it is. Nice. Nice little Janata strike at the right place at the right time. We'll be holding no cargo, but we'll give a nice purse to Cloud9. Oh, now top, top lane, though, they're looking to swing in. Big ah. spin of the Riptide, but the Fissure, or the <laughs> Stun, rather, not going to be connecting. And quickly, Ritsu gets the hell out of there. It looked like MSS got a block on his hook shot, was not able to engage. And it looks like both teams will disperse. Oh, with the exception of Shibby, <laughs> he takes a hard meld strike. He's able to get the Yules in, but that refraction, that pesky ball refraction, he can't seem to burst through. Just can't penetrate the shield, so they're just gonna try to hold position here, make sure the tier one doesn't get pushed down too heavily. Uh, that one, that one, I will say, Nishan probably should have connected with, but at the same time, the hook shot just blocked by uh, a basic lane creep, so maybe a little bit of misplaced from either side. But uh, overall, I, I like the fact that we're seeing a lot more activity from both these sides. And neither team is just letting the other farm, and that's important for, uh, say, kind of limiting the Naga Siren and what she can do uh, as she's looking for that sacred relic, and of course, limiting the Ember Spirit, who's looking for the comes first and battle three most likely next here's cloud nine looking to get their second tier one tower here in the mid lane brax happy to be that sieging unit now a desolator in hand you can see the tower just crumble like styrofoam at this point they'll be able to clear out the last wave and then head back to imagine look to engage jenkins who had been charging in looks like he will turn tail and they will have to let this opportunity go so what is Leviathan waiting for at this point, Blaze, to be able to kind of turn it up because it feels like they're slowly going to be put into this position where C9 can kind of take the better fight, especially now that Brax has picked up this Desolator. True, but I mean, they have the song level 2 soon. Right now, this level 1 song is going to be a long cooldown and uh, always considered an expense whenever you have to use it. Farming up the level 11 Naga and then having the level 2 song allows you to kind of actually use that as a, a, a tactical uh, point of value. And so you might be able to make an engagement where you set up more two-man stuns, a Fisher or the Earth Spike, and uh, find opportunities that way. Otherwise, you're still just playing a farm game. You want to uh, keep vision out on the map and avoid getting caught out by things like the, the MSS hook. Jenkins got what looked like a brief sight of SVG. Decided to pull off on the hook here. He does have a dust on hand. And they have Lion's Finger here, so if there was an opportunity to get a catch on someone like SVG, uh -huh. they would go for it, but he's, you know, able MSS to sneak smoked. in. Yep, top of Got above. track vision and he smoked. This should be a pretty easy kill on somebody. Uh, I was thinking the rear breaker, but now it looks like it might be the Lion. Ritsu's charged up here. At the same moment, they're going for another strike, but the chains are going to be on the other side. You see Nushim is the one caught out from MSS. He's able to hook in. Rocket's on. Track is already out. They get this kill, they get the bonus, and they got it. And up in the woods, you can see they were able to finish off Ritsu and make a quick getaway before Brax shows up. And it looks like they'll just have to trade a piece. A better trade, though, for Leviathan taking out the Ember Spirit. Yeah, they also have more smoke available, so they're able to continue to make plays. Um, there are some smokes banked up for Cloud9, but 
they really aren't in a position to use them more than what we just saw, a solo clockwork trying to find an opening. Um, we are going to see here MSS kind of pull back, get some mana, wait for his hook shot to cool down. Not that long of a cooldown, but bottom is where some action is going to be. I'm not sure about the kill potential without disables, though. Yeah, and plus she has that song. Help is on the way, dear. Here comes Jenkins charging in, decides to cancel off for the dust, and that makes oh. the quick finger and quick execution of SVG. Demon turns around with a weave, and he's imposing, like, hey, we got we got company on the way, and it's enough to kind of force Leviathan back under the tower, and he's right. Help is here. Ritsu hiding, crafty behind a bush here like a creeper. We'll go into the lane eventually and just kind of farm it out, but good little quick pick here from Leviathan. They punish SVG once again. From the second relic, really big momentum swing once she has at least the first component. She is very confident she'll be able to finish up the recipe. At this point, I think uh, the most important thing that Cloud9 can do right now is get a track out on the Naga Siren. The track tooltip allows you to actually see how much gold she's banking, and maybe you can punish that. But right now, he's he's just trying to stay alive, and that's not going to happen. Not at all. Easy charge, Nether Strike. Nothing SVG can do. Rotations do come in from MSS, who gets char or gets stunned up. And it will allow Leviathan to cool, kind of pull back. But that means all the meanwhile bottom lane, Tier 2 was taken down from top to bottom, allowing Cloud9 to get all that work in. And Brax will be able to pick up the last hit and walk away. He's got 2k gold saved up, Blaze, after completing out the Desolator here. Is Brax feeling confident enough to build into more damage, or is it time to step off for a BKB? Though it is a BKB into a Naga Song, as a note. Yeah, I mean, there's a risk with that. Uh, your Laguna Blade is going to be agged up pretty soon. Nether Strike will connect. But in the end, the BKB is still essential because it will allow you to deal with the Lion and the Earthshaker damage and disable. And also, if you get caught in the song without your BKB on, then you can just hammer that BKB. And as soon as the song ends, you won't be caught in the fallout, the echoes and everything else that are going to drop right then and there. So BKB is still essential for him this game. Ritsu begins his intense farming regimen it looks like here he just instantly remnants from camp to camp now sporting those boots of travel has the quick tp access and just quick move speed and he's looking to bump it up a bit if he's able to throw together a battle fury then the farm really grows out of control and we get to really see ember spirit in his high ceiling of late game as they anticipate they'll be able to kind of go toe to toe with this naga all the meanwhile look at that quick ages takedown brax kind of just walks away from the ages he's like oh yeah i should probably take that thing Goes back to pick it up and will hop up and continue his farm on Ancients. I mean, there could have been a discussion on who actually grabs it, but Brax will ultimately turn around and take it for himself. Yeah, T is pretty much the optimal hero here. I mean, it's very rare you're going to see it on somebody else in that five hero lineup, but uh, just a misclick and uh, thought thought differently about it. Anyways, uh, Lion Salty is going to be back up very shortly here. Lena, of course, has hers at level 2, about to be agonimed. I think she actually missed a kill opportunity on MSS. I'm not sure if she was worried about the fact that uh, the Clockwork had a Blade Mail before he got caught on the Yules, but there was like a f 500 HP Clockwork right next to her, and she had a Laguna Blade, and she walked away. This was about a minute and a half, two minutes ago, but yeah, I, I feel like there was an opportunity, but it, it you obviously have to be worried about getting by a blade mail, so I can understand the hesitation. Cloud nine. Either way, uh, now they have to deal with the the threat with the Aegis just kind of brute forcing. It's going to be guaranteeing this tier 2 tower falls and the Naga just focuses on farming, but uh, I'm curious actually if they draw the line at the other tier 1, tier 2s or only at the high ground. Yeah, does feel like certainly some, some type of battering ram play for now, having all 5 committed, but look at the quick rotation to the bottom. Ritzy with the boots of travel and MSS with a long hook shot. They go from mid to bottom in a blink of an eye and get the quick grab onto the Earthshaker. This puts him in a more comfortable spot. Echo is going to be taken out of the equation, though he didn't have the blink, obviously. It's still something to kind of make sure you don't neglect. Now with it out, at least 10 more seconds. They will tantalize this high ground push blaze bottom lane. They're going to see how much little poking damage they get on this tier 3. Though Jenkins is flirting with them. And that nether strike, hoping to bop them back. Plus, Nagasan is online as well as the Radiance here. So, this turns into quite a long-winded fight. It could uh, turn out to be a real hey, burn. They move in. They commit with the weave. Brax jumps in. Gets caught now with a stun. A fissure will block off his path. And he's going to get caught in the corner. Long shot. Though heavy bounces, Laguna will annihilate the first Aegis life. Though Shibby will go down himself without the buyback. Brax makes his return now and is happy to go in. Naga still holding the song. Jenkins will make the charge outside the front lines and uh oh, quickly realizes he could be put into a four on one. Will turn around, 180s himself back to base. Cloud9 toying with the idea of kind of hanging 
And actually, oh, we end up pulling out a pause. At all. I mean, they just don't have anything to sustain the team right now. TA, she'll have refraction, and 1437 will be able to heal her up, but 1437 himself is practically dead and yeah. would die to a Naga trailing around him with the illusions. So they, they definitely can try to force it with the Lena down, but it's a heavy risk. One good stun combo from Imagine, and they're going to be sent packing. And MSS says, let's do it, boy. Able to jump on the Naga. Can they take her out before the song? They certainly can. Whoa. 45 seconds, no buyback. And this was a huge hit. In the face of Leviathan. Rax is going to get graved up after the uh, finger does come. Noosh, big stun, but can't make it away. He'll go down. Shortly, Jenkins will go down thereafter. And now Cloud9 take over this bottom lane. And are going to look to quickly take down this Tier 3. Still relatively early in the game. Only 22 minutes, so some of these death timers are pretty small. But it looks like they're going to be taking a lot of early base damage here. That is all on MSS. If you hook anybody else in that situation, you cannot break the base. Hooking the Nagasar in there destroys her value, takes the Radiance out of the picture, no song at all, and they take a melee Rax as a result of that. Could actually be a game-winning hook coming in from MSS, and that is it just exactly how you do it. Ritsu comes back full HP, the Tiffin is the range Rax, and uh, they head on out. So, very nicely done, especially by the clockwork there. Uh, and that's what you need to do against the Naga Siren is find those opportunities to commit when you're confident in yourself. It really does. It, you can talk about what's a good or a bad siege uh, all day long, but what it comes down to is who you can isolate in the fights. And MSS found the clutch play there. And they are rewarded because of such clutch plays. They walk away, and Rax already down very early in this game for Leviathan. And we have to look to them now, Blaze, and what they can do. To bounce back from this point, Naga needs to kind of get back on that farming wagon here, get those boots to travel online, and try to just get to that point where hopefully her critical mass can hold it together for her team. But Cloud9 gets such a big boost from that. Oh man, my goodness. Up here, Brax, easy and quick execution of the Lion, but now pops his BKB. Mm. Jenkins trying to pin him down as much as possible, but they can't quite do enough. And Rich is already here. It's going to turn into a disaster. They're going to lose Jenkins, and Shibby is going to force to quickly get away. And Ritsu will not be able to see him. Tries to get off quickly a sleight of fist or something, but it's already too late. But now it's feeling like Cloud9 are going to be constantly pushing here, restricting any sort of area of farm for Leviathan. So is VG going to be still controlling the map here? Just getting one good obs down maybe uh, in this position on the, the plateau up here, or even further back it looks like. It's, as long as he doesn't place it in vision of the tower. He did place it in vision of the tower. There's the pings, and that probably won't. Whoops. Well, we will have to deal with it as it is for now. But I imagine overall, Cloud9's game plan is just take our advantage and keep throwing it that <laughs> their way. If this Naga can't comfortably go out there and farm, then the rest of our team is just going to starve out from getting nothing here. And they all think about maybe moving in, but they quickly cancel back. I don't know if there's going to be a situation where Leviathan maybe could take a fight by this Tier 2, but they are certainly coming together, Blaze, like they want to make a fight happen. I mean, if they lead in with a nice offensive song, is there really going to be enough to shut everyone down? It looks like Jenkins is just going to be the one to throw himself into the battle. This could be just their this is all or nothing at this point. And they're trying to quickly take out the Dazzle, a finger and not enough. But look at the turnaround here. Flying Zebra gets caught up with MSS, so he's taking care of quickly. And Cloud9 just show that we are just too big and too bad by this point. And you will not catch us misfooted. Leaving the lone MSS survivor. again, he destroys the back line perfectly, isolates the Earthshaker. Earthshaker did nothing at all. He d died to his own blade, the blade mill, the clockwork practically, killing himself on that damage. Uh, the Echo Slam wasn't in play. Like It just seems like MSS is really able to exploit his opponents with his clockwork when there's no floor staff in play. There's just no counterplay. Uh, these heroes uh, have no way of jumping out of the cogs easily. All he's playing up against is the Lena Yules and one floor staff from the Lion. He's just having a heyday, and he is easily this match is MVP. Without question. And meanwhile, the Radiance, like, what has it done for the Naga Siren? It, he hasn't been able to stop a push with it. He hasn't farmed up a new item. This is it. Uh, they really just pressed the attack right at the time where uh, Naga was starting to come online, but wasn't quite there yet. Yep. Cloud9 just kind of read the game out and recognized when they were going to be able to get more done before this Naga could really just even start coming online. Got the Radiance, which is wonderful. You can't have a Naga without a Radiance, after all, but that's just the start of her farming tools, and 
when you don't have anywhere to farm and already C9 are looking to constrict you back into your base because of the huge fight that they were able to take, you're going to be stuck just kind of without doing anything. So that's going to go ahead and wrap up just game number one, folks, of this grand final best of five action. C9 are going to have the one game advantage. They are certainly playing like they are 80-20 favorites. We'll have to see what the response is going to be from Team Leviathan here. This is Kyle Guy for Beyond the Summit, joined by Blaze. You can catch him over on his Twitter, at Blaze Casting, and we'll be back in a few moments for game two of the BTS America's Grand Final Matchup, Leviathan against Cloud9. See you